All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me have your attention once again. Are you still having a good time? Say amen. amen. You know what I'm pleased about? I am pleased that it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and some of you are still awake. <laughs> I had to go get me a cup of coffee a while ago to kind of get my, you know, second wind here. But I'm delighted that you're here. And uh, it's going to be our privilege to hear from uh, Brother Derek Frank here in just a moment. 28 years he was a pastor in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, if you know anything about ministry, anybody that can pastor for 28 years is a tenacious individual <laughs> who is not seeking the approval of men. Amen? Well, anyway, Derek and his wife moved here to the United States and using their own resources, funded a ministry that they uh, began. And uh, today, we're going to have the opportunity to hear him share a message with us uh, entitled, Let the Lion Roar. And so, uh, would you help me welcome then Derek... Frank to the platform here at Prophecy in the News. Those of you at home watching once again on the live streaming, we're delighted to have you join those here in the room in Denver, Col I mean in, Bo in Colorado Springs. I told you I was tired. Colorado <laughs> Springs, Colorado. Derek, God bless you. Thank it's great you to so have much. you. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you. I truly am relieved at four o'clock in the afternoon. There are so many of you, so <laughs> thank you for, for coming. Extraordinary journey for my wife, Francoise, and I, as uh, Gary was saying, we have done 28 years in ministry, and I would never have expected for one moment when I set off on this journey that I would end up being transformed from being a pastor into being a pactor. Now, do any of you know what a pactor is? A pastor who's become an actor. That's what God did to me. There was the day when God just simply said to me, as I'm after all these years in ministry, um, simply you can go on giving thousands of messages to the same few hundred people, or you can take one message to hundreds of thousands of people. And in that moment, I knew exactly what the message was, and I'll share more of this on the way. But as we set off on this journey, which is now about three years ago, we would never have realized quite how God, when he makes a word like that, in a sense only tells you just a little bit of what's going to be involved. If he told us it all, we would never have started. Because filmmaking was something we knew nothing about. My daughter, who was actually directed the film, she's the filmmaker. She had the giftedness and the ability to do this. But it was a journey that we've been taken on when we can only say, to God be the glory, because it was an extraordinary journey that was to open the door to uh, acting with uh, Kevin Sorbo. Any of you seen God's Not Dead? Well, there I was with Kevin Sorbo and there's Stephen Bold. We have messianic leaders like Sid Roth and Chuck Pierce and Mark Biltz and so on. We end up with a film with all sorts of special effects. We end up with the complexities of filmmaking. But even more extraordinarily, God has enabled us to take the lid off replacement theology, the view that the church has replaced Israel in God's purposes, with a unique resource which, to our knowledge, exists nowhere else in the world. This film, Let the Lion Roar, is a docudrama. It involves enactments. I'm going to show you a trailer at the end. If you'd like your very own copies, you may have seen. Uh, this, is, this is it, and uh, you can get it from our booth, and we will even sign it for you. So there it is. And what it does is to take the lid off a lie that as I've dug more and more into it, I have realized goes almost to the very beginnings of the church that has shaped church history in ways beyond which most believers have almost no perception of. If you go and ask the average believer, what's your view on replacement theology? Most likely, every one of them will say, excuse me, what? Replacement theology? It wouldn't mean a thing. But for most, if not a very, very high proportion, their faith, their belief is actually shaped by replacement theology. So I'm going to be sharing more of this, and I'll show you a trailer at the end. There is a book which goes with a film called Escaping the Great Deception. That will give you much, much more of it. But more of that later on. Let me just begin with asking you a question to wake you up at 4 o'clock. Have you heard the roar of the lion? The roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Right, I'm glad you've heard the roar. The roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's a reason I can ask you this in a way that you can be asked this question, which no previous generation could be. Because we are the generation 
which is the very, very closest there has ever been to hearing that roar in all its fullness. Do you realize there has never been a generation as close as the one that we actually live in in this minute, with the very, very nearest has ever been. Now, we don't know where it's going to be, five months, five years, 50 years, or whatever. But if you were to set it in the context of the prophets of the Old Testament, speaking like 3,000 years ago, you and I are that close to it. From their viewpoint, as they would look forward to us, we are that close to hearing the end-time roar in all of its fullness. Let me just remind you of a few of things that the prophets have said. Let me take these words of Hosea, Hosea 10 verse 8, and he says, they shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Yes, he will roar and his sons will roar. They will come trembling from the west. They shall come like birds from Egypt, like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. Now, Hosea give or take, was prophesying that 3,000 years ago. What sort of spiritual binoculars do you think Hosea had to see that and to hear it? But Hosea recognized that when the people finally returned to the land, the next thing would be that they would then return to the Lord. And when the people finally returned to the Lord... The next thing is that the Lord returns to the land and brings in his reign and his rule of righteousness. Listen to the way Hosea goes on at the end of, uh, of, of his prophecy. And he says, chapter 14, I will heal their waywardness. I will love them freely. I will be like dew to Israel. She will blossom like a lily. And from 3,000 years ago, Hosea was seeing how this land would blossom and the people would blossom. You can add to Hosea so many of the prophets. Let's add in Isaiah. Isaiah could see the time when nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. That's what he saw. This will be the consequence when Israel returned to the land and to the Lord and the Lord returned the light of Israel would go across the world and the nations would see this light. Add in some of the other prophets. Think of Zechariah. He foresaw the time when 10 men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of just one Jew by the hem of the robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Jeremiah Let's add in these words. The days are coming when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And this is what you and I are actually that close to. So many of the other prophets speak in the same way. Think of Ezekiel with the Valley of Dry Bones. You can go on and on with the different prophets. And here is the thing. They could see this with their spiritual binoculars from 3,000 years ago. But you and I do not need spiritual binoculars like they did. Because we are so, so close. Here is the extraordinary thing. I wonder if there's anyone else who can say the same thing that I can say. I was conceived in the same year that the present day nation of Israel back in the land was conceived in. Anyone else here could say that? You were conceived in the year 1948. What an extreme. There's a few. Great. Well done, guys. And for the rest of you youngsters, you are even nearer. Isn't this extraordinary that we live in these amazing times? Now, this morning, I got up and I had the most extraordinary experience. I may be privileged to have a window on the correct side of the hotel to do this, but I opened the curtains and what did I see? Whoa, the most amazing view, spectacular view of the mountains. 
But do you know what really excited me beyond anything else? Anyone guess? Not the sunrise, no. On the top, if you look on the mountain, you can see a little bit of snow. That's right. I have been an avid skier all my life. Uh, not as avid, not as good now. There was a year when I was at my zenith, but I didn't notice at the time. It's been downhill ever since in more ways than one. But snow for me has always excited just to see it from the distance. The fact that there's valleys, and just to see that snow so excited me. But if Gary had said, hey, Derek, when you finish speaking, I've got my helicopter outside, and we are actually going to fly up to the snow so that we can be on the snow. I would be imagining skiing down. I would just be so excited to be there, actually to be there. It's so exciting to see from a distance. But how much more when you are right there? Now, that's the difference between the prophets of old who could only see with their prophetic eyes, could only hear with their prophetic ears. But you and I are right there. We might actually only be on the edge of the snow line and not quite in it, but we are that close. And that is how excited we should be. Because I think if God said to the prophets, Hosea and Isaiah and Zechariah and Jeremiah and so He said, hey guys, I have got the most wonderful bonus for you. I am going to allow you to move 3,000 years forward and you can go and prophesy in what the people then call 2015. Can you imagine if those prophets were there with us today? What do you think they would be prophesying in our times? Do you think they'd be saying, oh, it's all doom and gloom? I think they will be saying, Ooh, hey, yaha, we're right on the edge of the triumph. We are that close. We are a people who are on the brink of triumph and we can have hope. We can speak truth into this situation. We can override all this stuff that's going on. We can proclaim the mighty sovereign purposes of God in our time. Do you think they'd be saying that? You do? You don't seem very convinced. Well, I think they'd be saying that even if you don't think that. I think they would be speaking into a situation that would not deny any of the circumstances, but they would say, ISIS is not going to last forever, but righteousness is. There's a season, but there's a greater story. And I think they would be inspiring us to stand in the truth of God's promises. Because I think those guys didn't just get God's word in the moment by accident. I think they had to strive to hear it and to see it. But as they did, they got hold of the fact that however much evil seemed to prevail, God's power and God's potential to work through his people was even greater. And I believe that's what they would be prophesying today. And the question is, why is it when we're in this time, we may see crisis in so many ways and problems in so many ways. But actually, when spiritual opportunity exists for God's people in our day and our time, as in no previous generation, that the church by and large is so powerless, that the church by and large seems to be hooked on compromise with the world in the most unseemly of ways. Why is it that as we look at the times we're in, that there's, there's even sort of approval of calling what was previously known as evil good? All this thing of the redefinition of marriage, accommodating this, even celebrating it. We live in a time of abomination. We live in a time where it's a sort of debate now, well, if three people wanted to get married, would you call them a thruple? If you find that your parent is transgender, do you call them mopper? You know, this is the world you and I now live in. And the church sort of accommodates us and even celebrates. Oh, this is gracious. This is wonderful. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that in these times, in one sense, that evil seems to be so prevailing, and yet on the other hand, for God's people, there is so much power and so much opportunity potentially there if we will stand in his purposes. Why is it that so much of the church seems to be just so blinkered and so blind? And there's actually a very simple answer. 
And we get it from the way in which Jesus taught in the day when he came and had people around him. And he could have gone in and said, hey, guys, I'm the Messiah. See me. Just come and recognize me. But he didn't do that, did he? He taught in parables. Drove the disciples mad. Times went to one day say, why on earth are you keeping using parables? No one understands. Just tell them straight. Then they'll get it. But Jesus replied very simply with these words. And he says, whoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. God never forces his truth on anyone. You have as much or as little of God's truth as you want. So if you want more, he will give you more. But if you don't want the implications with going, that go with having more, he will just say, that's it. You don't have to have more. Actually, I'll even take from you what you have. And that is what is going on in the church today. That so many are seeing, but not seeing. Hearing, but not hearing. Not recognizing the times of opportunity that actually lie in all that is going on as we are so near to the end of time trial. This is how Jesus then went on. He said, blessed are you because your eyes see, your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you longed, what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear. And as there was distinctive opportunity for blessing when he was there for those who would receive him, standing there before their very eyes, so as we stand on the edge of these extraordinary times, if we will have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open to engage with this, we can have a blessing that those prophets of old would have absolutely longed to have had. That is what is there for you and for me in the times that we are actually in. Because what God wants to do is to open our eyes. He wants us to be able to see the spiritual overview of what is actually going on. There's a wonderful verse which says, 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Everything that we see going on now is only temporary. God says to us, if you would like to have your eyes opened, if you would like to have your ears open, if you're willing to walk in the consequences of that revelation, then I will show to you a great overview of that which is eternal and unchanging, which everything which is going on at the moment has to be contextualized underneath. I will actually do that for you. I will open your eyes. I will open your hearts. I will give to you a hope. I will give to you a power that the people of this world without me do not have. Now, it's very interesting looking at what's going on in the world at this time. There's really three reactions I could see going on amongst people. For many, they simply want to bury their heads in the sand about what's going on, like the proverbial ostrich. You know, the ostrich buries its head. But the problem is, if you go and bury your head in the sand, you leave a very big thing back there for someone to give a very big boot to. That's the hazard of burying your head in the sand. What will the devil do to you? He will kick you. There are those who will look at the world and try and think, well, we need to think about what's going on. Let's analyze it. Let's review it. The trouble is, from almost any perspective you look at it, It is bad news. And the weather forecast looks even worse. Bad clouds coming this way. Even if you just think about finance, trillions and trillions of dollars just within this one nation of America as as debt, adding global debt, the numbers are so huge they go utterly beyond consequence. I think, am I right to say, it's only about 30 years ago America didn't even have any debt, and is it? like 20 trillion it's heading to. It's like if you take a balloon 
you can blow it up and you can keep blowing. <laughs> and the thing gets bigger and bigger. And it's got so big, you think, well, one more blow, I'm sure it'll take. And the day comes when suddenly it's bang! It goes pop. No one knows how long, but even just on that one view alone, there's a great warning coming. If you were to look at the military situation, the settlement that's just reached through the run, maybe there is a much louder bang coming much sooner. If you just look at any number of other criteria, global warming you can take. Look at political turbulence. Look at terrorism. Look at the potential for natural catastrophe, unnatural catastrophe. There is just so much hazard around there that for the most part, if people look at it, they think actually the guy who's got his head buried in the sand may not be so daft after all. That's how it is. It is hopeless if you look at it human. But if you will allow your eyes to be open to the eternal perspective, the one that is not changing, then there is a perspective that can transform your whole mentality. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs which says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The lion is not the biggest animal in the jungle. He's not the largest, but he is the loudest. He's much smaller than an elephant. But over all that sound, that cacophony of sound in the jungle, comes the sound of the roar of the lion. And he is respected for his authority. And when we look into the eternal realm, God says, if you are righteous, if you are in right standing with me, I will give you a boldness to stand in these times, in my authority. I will roar through you. That's what he says to every believer. This is the extraordinaries of his promise to those who in these times will look and see and hear the revelation that he wants to give. There's a verse that promises to us, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 puts it like this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That is what we as believers are actually given as resource. This is why we may be bold. No, we don't have the weaponry of the world. No, we are not the largest. But we can be the loudest. And we can have the power that can break down spiritual strongholds. That is the potential that we have in these times. And I want to try and give a picture to you that comes from Revelation, the end of chapter 9, which speaks of a time far beyond anything we are yet in, and yet speaks of the power of the greatness of God's overview that supersedes all that will then go on. It's a time when plague is raining down on mankind. Plagues of judgment that are actually killing huge numbers. And yet rebelliousness on those who stay alive just carries on and carries on. But as you go into Revelation 10, you get an extraordinary overview that supersedes all that. Let's just read these words from Revelation 9, and they'll give you some perspective to it. It says, then I saw, sorry, let me just pick on the end of the, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still not, did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or thefts. We're not at that point yet, but it's not that hard to imagine getting to that point. That is the degree of rebelliousness that will be exhibited in mankind. That is where things are going. We don't know how quickly, but that's where they're heading. But also, get into the next chapter. And then it's the most incredible overview that goes beyond this. Because as you begin in Revelation 10, carrying straight on from just what we've read, we read this. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open his hand. 
He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voice of seven thunders spoke. What a picture that utterly supersedes the one we've just read about. A vastly greater eternal overview. And it goes on like this. It says, Then the angel I'd seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that's in them, the earth and all that's in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to the servants, his servants, the prophets. Isn't that amazing? Just as he announced to Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and Isaiah, this is what they were seeing, this is what they're hearing. All that was promised back then is going to be fulfilled. And however great and extreme the rebelliousness of mankind becomes, still a much greater overview. So you can see a president usurping the symbol of the rainbow. And put it on what was used to be called the White House. And you can wonder where things are going. Well, the answer to quote another president is President Reagan, who famously said, You ain't seen nothing yet. Is that right? Is that Ronnie Reagan said, You ain't seen nothing yet? And as we look at what's going on, that is almost certainly the case. But there is a vastly, vastly greater overview. It's about the roar of a lion. That God wants to go through his people. And we are blessed to be at that time where we have a potential for that to happen to us like never, ever before. There's an authority that we can have coming down from highest heaven into these times. We just need the veil removing. But tragically over much of the church, there is a veil that is the consequence of replacement theology that stops people seeing into the prophetic, that stops them getting this revelation that can enable them to have authority and power. And the reason it works as a veil is very simple. When the lie was brought by the church that it had replaced Israel in God's purposes, it had a problem. There were all these literal promises to the people of Israel. What do you do with those? That's a problem. Answer, you allegorize them, you spiritualize them. You say, no, they're not actually literally true. They don't actually get fulfilled literally. They're just meant to be understood symbolically, prophetically. Now, the moment you allegorize God's promises, the moment you spiritualize them, you lose the vision of the literal truth. And with all things, if you don't practice them, you lose it. It's like if you learn a language and you don't use it, you lose it. And so that ability to see into the prophetic, to see the literal fulfillment that would come, was lost. And a veil came down on the church about seeing into the prophetic. And for the church to stand in the revelation that is potentially there, the veil that has come from replacement theology has to be removed. It has to be taken away. And this is the message that God touched my heart and the heart of my wife, Francoise, that we, in some way, should do something, find this resource that can go out into the hands of many, not just to release a movie, but to release a movement. It needs many, many, many people to do it. But as God enabled us to produce this film, here's something that anyone can take. You might find it very hard to get into a conversation with your neighbor at church about replacement theology. That all sounds very heady. But you would say, hey, I've watched this film the other day. Here's a copy. What do you think of it? Now, I promise you this. If you take enough copies, it'll be exactly like sowing seed in the field. And you know how the parable goes. And one that ends up in the stony ground. The other bit gets taken by the birds. Others get blown away. Weeds grow. But some take root. And where it takes root you get great harvest. And the Lord simply says to us, if you will make a movie, I'll make a movement. And it needs people like yourself to take this. And in that sphere of influence that you have that is absolutely unique to you, you have a sphere of influence no one else has. Every one of you, absolutely unique. 
that you say, Lord, what is it you want me to do amongst these people? That the lie of replacement theology can be removed. That the veil can be lifted. That people, amongst other things, can see the literal truth of God's promises. And as they do so, to find the eyes get open to the truth of prophetic revelation. And as this happens, to see more and more of the authority. To see the vision of that angel in Revelation 10 who has a roar like a lion. It's not his roar. He's getting it from the lion of the tribe of Judah. And inside every one of us is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I'm just going to tell you something of the story of how the film came to be made and then take you forward into how God opened this up and where it, I think it might lead you to in your own understanding what you can do with it. But let me just track back. The wonderful thing is guys of my age can now look back over many years. And I was a young pastor maybe 25 years or so ago. And uh, as I look back on those times, it was in the days of uh, the John Wimber movement. Are any of you around signs and wonders, John Wimber? Any of the such ring bells? One or two buddies. Great. Do you remember dear John? Great big John. And he really loved to get people praying for more of the Spirit. You pray for people, the Spirit to come down. The great line was more of the Spirit. Lord. We used to be praying this. So I was on the staff of a large charismatic church in England. And as we were doing, sort of what you might call low-level visions were quite, were quite common as a result. So God would say he sees you as a beautiful, fragrant rose. And it you've got a few thorns on the side, and there's this thorn, he wants to take that away, you know, and the other thorn and all this sort of thing. And, you know, this was the sort of type of vision you get. The only trouble is that God gave me a vision that wasn't quite low-level. It was horrifyingly, if that's the right word to use, high-level. And this was very simply it. Just praying in prayer meetings, I would regularly get the vision of what seemed like the front of a, what I assumed was a church building. It was a Greek building of pillars. And there were people going in and out in medieval costume. And then it would switch to inside people with headphones on. There was a conference going on, international conference. A word was being shared. And every time, this brief little vision would end with the words, complete the reformation. Complete the reformation. It was a shocking, shocking word. Not one that, oh, isn't that lovely? This was God's voice. And when you hear a word like that, you know it's God's voice. Now, I have to admit, I was a pretty ambitious young pastor. But this was just a little bit even above my pay grade. Go finish the reformation. Go complete the reformation. This was just crazy. And the problem was, every time I shared it with anyone, I mean, what did people do with it? The guy's off the wall. He's a nutter. This is their reaction to me all the time. The one thing I did discover was what it was like for Joseph when he went and told his brothers, your sheaves will bow down to mine. That was the one lesson I did learn quickly. Beyond that, I had no idea what to do with this. And I simply had to say to the Lord, look, either you give me an interpretation or you stop it because I'm going to blow up. I can't take it anymore. And it stopped. The only thing was I could never forget it. It went with me everywhere. Complete the Reformation. You know, I mean, I mean, just went with me. And this went on for years. Fast forward some years later, my wife Francoise and I were walking through the old city of Geneva, Switzerland. And there I had an experience, some of you may have also had, that you see in the physical what you have previously seen in the spiritual. Have you had these experiences? You know what it's like. Uh, do you feel wobbly? Is it goose pimples? You get shaky. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't know what. Oh, I've seen it. Already. And you, this extraordinary. The only thing was, this, I realized, wasn't just seeing a building, something you've seen in the spiritual. That's shocking enough. But this was the cathedral of St. Pierre in the old city of Geneva, Switzerland, from which John Calvin had preached the Reformation. I hadn't connected the two. And in that moment, I mean, <laughs> Francois said, I did look, you know, I'm oh, like this, and she's watch out. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was so shocking to see it. I knew I was a marked man. I didn't know what to do with it. Now, one thing God didn't tell me was I was going to spend 11 years as a pastor of a church so a few hundred meters, a few hundred yards away in due course. I had no idea at that time. It's amazing how much he doesn't tell you. But that was quite enough. And I knew I had to get to the bottom. What did it mean to complete the Reformation? I had no idea. 
Now, all I could think to do was to sort of start reading the Reformation. Now, if any of you ever tried reading the Reformation, the books are this thick, they're that back, they're this heavy, they're full of dust, they are so complicated. I had no idea what I was looking for. And it's so dense, the thinking, it's so ancient history, it seems. I had no idea what I was looking for. And then one day, absolutely in God's mercy, I came across a tiny little story that unhooked the whole thing. And it was a very simple story. When the city of Geneva was, as it were, taken over by John Calvin, the city was actually transformed during the Reformation. It went from being what was called the stinkiest city in all Europe to being, John Knox described, as the fairest example of the kingdom of God since the time of the apostles. It was transformed in one generation. But here's the thing. Fifty years before Calvin ever arrived in Geneva, the Jewish people had been evicted. It was 200 years after his death before they were ever allowed to return. In other words, John Calvin did nothing about anti-Semitism. The Jews could go into Geneva for the day if they paid a toll, but that was all. They couldn't stay overnight. So here's this city that is transformed. It's become a city of refuge for people who are displaced by the Reformation, the kickback. The doors of Geneva are open. It doubled in size. The only people who were not allowed to stay there were the Jews. And so a subliminal message went out wrapped in the DNA of the gospel, the reformed gospel. And it simply said this. Whatever else the Reformation is changing, there is one thing it's not changing. It's our attitude to Jewish people. They deserve to be cursed. They're to blame for everything. They will always be cursed. That was wrapped up in the DNA of the gospel that went out and formed the Protestant church. Once I realized that, I realized what, or thought, suspected what was the great incompletion of the Reformation. It was the total lack of understanding that God had any continuing place for the people of Israel. Now, it immediately begged a question. Was this just an oversight on Calvin's part? So busy, didn't have time to do anything about anti-Semitism. Or was it a very, very, very deliberate choice on the part of John Calvin? That was my question. And thankfully, that is not a hard thing to discover. Because if you look in Calvin's institutes, uh, Calvin's commentary, I should say, on Romans 11. Romans 11, 26, the famous verse which says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Here's what Calvin says. The Israel of God is what Paul calls the church. You can check it out online. Just Google his commentary on Romans 11. You can see it there. He also says, if you want to look in Galatians 6.16, the Israel of which refers to the Israel of God, he says there are two classes who bear this name, a pretended Israel, which appears to be so in the sight of men, and the true Israel of God. It was no accident that John Calvin did nothing about anti-Semitism. It was an absolutely deliberate choice. And once I began to see that, then it took me on a journey. Because Calvin had modeled the regeneration of Geneva on a book which was written by Augustine in the 5th century called The City of God. Now, check back to Augustine and guess what sort of things that Augustine was saying. Augustine, here's his comment. The true image of the Hebrews is Judas Iscariot, who sells the Lord for silver. The Jew can never understand the scriptures and will forever bear the guilt of Jesus. So here was Calvin basing his view on Augustine. It was very, very deliberate. And out of this, it was then possible to see very clearly that Calvin was saying, hey, There's scriptures which need to be reinterpreted. So, I know there's a promise, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, which says, God says to the people of Israel, I'll love you with an everlasting love. But maybe that's got to be sort of reinterpreted a bit to mean something else. I don't know how he got past 
verse 36 of Jeremiah 31, because that goes on to say this promise to Israel, saying, only if mankind can ever count the stars in the sky or work out everything that's under the ground will I ever give up on loving this nation. And the, note the words that follow, which says, despite what they've done, the unconditionality, despite what they've done. Now, here's the thing in our time. The more man has developed technology, we've got much, much better at counting the stars in the sky, and we understand what's under the earth so much better. But are we any nearer counting what's in the sky? All we know at the last count, there were about 100 billion galaxies. We were still counting at the time. And the number of planets, I think, is like a one with 21 lots of noughts after it. We cannot count it. So man's technology goes on, but the impossibility of fulfilling that statement of God has got greater and greater. In other words, it's saying, despite what these people are, God's never going to give up on them. But Calvin saw fit to override that. Calvin, the great exegete, can look at Romans 11, when Paul asks the question, says, has God given up on the people of Israel? No! He gets around that one as well. This is where it led Calvin to. He was that entrenched in his position about anti-Semitism and the Jewish people. As far as he was concerned, they were to have nothing to do with the rediscovery of the gospel of grace. They were to figure absolutely nowhere in it. And I started digging further and further into this, and you can go back across Augustine, and you can dig further into what he said. Go to Chrysostom. Now, this was one of uh, Augustine's uh, buddies. And let me give you this quote of John Chrysostom as well. Again, another famous 5th century uh, church father. And he says, because God hates the Jews, it is the duty of Christians to hate them. Many I know respect the Jews and think their present way of life a venerable one. This is why I hasten to uproot and tear down this terrible opinion. The synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it's also a den of robbers and lodging for wild beasts. When God forsakes a people, what hope of salvation is left? When God forsakes a place, that place becomes the dwelling of demons. That's what Chrysostom said. And you can check out many of these other church fathers. And clearly by the time, 4th, 5th century, it was all about anti-Semitism. This is where the church was at. So though Calvin, when he wrote his Institutes of the Christian Religion, saying that this would be the great resource for Protestantism to be based on, and he was going to take the church back to its original beliefs, he went back a long way. He went back a thousand years. He went back to the fourth and fifth century. But he never went right back to the start. Rather like if you're going to put up a great big skyscraper, you need to dig right down to the solid foundation. He dug down a long way, but he was still on soft soil never got down to bedrock. And in that was the explanation of the incompletion of the Reformation. And in that, as I increasingly discovered, was the explanation of church history and where the church is at today and what may be about to happen to the church if it does not repent of replacement theology. You don't have to be a great church historian in this day and age with all the resources there are to dig. And you can then track this position of the 4th and 5th century church fathers well, back to Constantine, 315, Council of Nicaea and all this, when Jewish people, if they wanted to become part of the church, had to renounce every vestige of Jewishness. So even by that stage, the church is disconnected from its Jewish roots. You can track back into the 200s and the 100s. And there is evidence of way back there how what has become called replacement theology, which is a modern term, but the disconnection of the church from its Jewish roots. And with that was the entire loss of understanding of God's calling to Israel and God's choice of Israel as the main frame for his saving purposes. You see, to Israel, God very, very clearly said, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I'll make you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what God promised to Israel. Israel is to be like a lighting circuit to the world. He didn't choose Israel necessarily because he liked them. They weren't his favorites. He just chose to love them. And he chose to reveal himself to them. He said, I'm going to reveal myself to you, and I'm going to leave it to you as to what you do with that. 
But I'm still going to use you either way. If you respond to me and my desire to dwell amongst you, I am going to bless you in a way that the world cannot avoid noticing. If, on the other hand, you choose to go the other way, I'm going to deal with you in a way that the world cannot help but noticing. This was his choice of Israel. Israel was chosen to serve that the world may be saved. Now, up toward the time when the Messiah came, Israel was not doing too well as the light of the world. But the Messiah came as the light of the world. And at least some Jewish people received him as the light of the world. And they received his life into them. Previously, they'd only got God on the outside. Now they've got God on the inside. They got his light. They got his life. And they also got the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. This is why they were so bold. This is why God could use them to turn the world upside down. And we would not be here today were it not for those Jewish believers who were willing to face such persecution for the sake of their Messiah. But they understood what it was about. Because when the Messiah came to them, he spoke about the kingdom. He spoke about the coming kingdom that was going to be fulfilled as God had promised historically through the prophets to the people of Israel. And he was going to bring about this kingdom through them. That his light, the light of God, would be seen through Israel to the nations. And the devil could do nothing whatsoever to change that reality. They had the light. They had the life. They had the lion. And all he'd got was a lie. That's all he got. Compared with the light and the life and the lion, all he got was a lie. And the lie he had got was to go around whispering in the ears of believers... Did God really say he's still got a continuing purpose for Israel? And the answer from the early believers was, yes, of course he has. And the devil's got battered ears from this. But as time went on, more and more Gentiles came into the church and gradually started to buy that lie. And it was a strategy of the devil to sow this lie to disconnect the church from its roots. The devil can never create anything. He can only desecrate. And he knew that if he could at least at first cause confusion, that would result in disconnection. And the more the church would get disconnected from its roots, the less it would be drawing the life that it should have. The less it has the life, the less power it's going to have. The more it's going to go astray. You might liken it to saying, if you've got a boat which is moored, but you cut the mooring. You don't know where the boat's going to go, but sooner or later, it's going to hit the rocks somewhere. He couldn't make that happen, but he just knew that if the church could be cut adrift, it would go wrong. It would crash. And this is what then happened. Now, for the early church, they were just so clear about the reality of the kingdom. When Jesus, Yeshua, comes back in Acts chapter One, we read about as the resurrected and the Lord comes back. He spent 40 days with the apostles, and it didn't say teaching them how to do church growth. It didn't say he taught them about how to evangelize. It says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. That's all he taught them about, the kingdom of God. I think there was a lot of very special teaching went on for Peter because a while back previously, what we call Matthew 16, 18, I'm not sure Jesus used verses like that, but anyway, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And I'm sure Peter, being the courteous guy he was, said, thanks very much, but I don't think he understood what were the keys. But after 40 days of teaching, I think he did understand what the keys were. Because when he preaches, in this great opportunity he's got to preach to 3,000, we assume they would have been 100% Jewish, in what we call Acts 2 and the 26 verses there, he allocated a mere two verses to what most people would call the full gospel, repent, believe, be baptized, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Only two verses. The other 24 
were all about God's continuing purposes for Israel. That's how he preached to this Jewish congregation. It was all about the coming of the kingdom that the Messiah had come. This was the foundation of what came to be known as the church. But at the Reformation, when they apparently rediscover the gospel, they never dig down that far. They get one of the two keys. They get the key of what it is to be saved, which is by grace and through faith. They certainly get that key. But they do not get the key of God's continuing purposes. The gospel of grace is never set in the context of the gospel of the kingdom. That people may be saved, that we might enter the kingdom. So it's like you get hold of the ticket and you say thank you very much and you sort of go in through the front door. You've no idea that there's this great big building that you're to go into and there's all these people standing around the hallway saying, well, we're inside, we've got the ticket now. But they never went in to this building which is the glorious kingdom of God. And because they never did this, they don't have the veil lifted from their eyes to see the literal fulfillment of the prophetic purposes of God that were declared to the prophets. And that's why we have a church today which you might say only sort of works. Now I've done, as Gary generously said, 28 years of week-on-week -week ministry. And I've seen church sort of work. And Francois and I, we've ministered both in England and in Switzerland. We've been in large churches and small churches. We've been in traditional churches and charismatic churches. We've seen a whole range. We've been actually in a very affluent church. We've been in a very impoverished church. We've seen the range, and we've also watched many other pastors we know in all their variations of church. And I've only ever seen church, I have to say, sort of work. Now, we've seen people converted, we've seen people healed, we've seen miracles of all sorts, we've supported missions, we've had wonderful praise services, we've seen this, we've seen that. And it does work to an extent. But is this really the glorious church this in the end times, when we are this close that God wants to say, wow, that was my idea of the church right on the last times. It's so far adrift. Why is it the world is so much better at changing the church than the church is at changing the world? We should have streams of living water going out, and instead we've got the dirty water of the world coming in. There is something fundamentally adrift. And I came to realize it was to do with the incompletion of the Reformation. When the gospel of grace was recovered, but the context of God's saving purposes for Israel was never realized, and actually deliberately not realized by the Reformers. And so the result was a gospel that did transform lives. The city of Geneva was transformed, people's lives were transformed, because they have been under the curse of sort of medieval feudalism for so long. They've been under the, the control of the Roman Catholic Church. There have been no access to Scripture for a thousand years for the everyday person. And they were set free from superstition. They found grace. They did find a living relationship with the Lord. And it transformed their lives. And their lives got straightened up. And they got blessed spiritually. And they got blessed humanly and personally. Because their lives got straightened up. They got in proper relationship with people. And blessing came. No one went around saying, is this all there is to it? I mean, they're just so thankful for what they've got. But here's the thing. The gospel was all about just me and God. And how I go to heaven when I die. It was a very, very self-centered gospel. And that is the gospel that tracks down, as you and I know, really in so many senses down to today. And it ends up with people actually believing something which Jesus never, ever said. Jesus never, ever said, seek first your own personal salvation and all this will be added to you. It's a total misquote. But a huge amount of preaching centers on that. Seek first your own personal salvation, and all these things are going to be added to you. He said and said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But because of that loss of the second key, the loss of the understanding of the kingdom that God still intends to bring in through his people of Israel, there is then this blindness. There is this twisting of what the gospel is really all about. And here is really where the rubber hits the road. 
If you do not understand God's saving purposes through Israel, you'll never understand his saving purposes. Israel is not God's end purpose in salvation. But until you understand his purposes through Israel, you will not understand his final purposes in salvation. So what happened at the Reformation was very simply encapsulated, if you know the phrase, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you know that phrase, well, you can add anything, really, if you have the truth. You might even have nothing but the truth, the truth you have. But if you do not have the whole truth, the truth you have can be distorted. If you don't have the whole truth, you can end up making wrong assumptions and make bad decisions, which have other consequences. And you thought you had the truth. And that's the picture of the church. The church today that only sort of works. Yes, there is the truth. They've got hold of the gospel of grace, that we're saved by grace through faith. But it's not the whole truth because it doesn't have the context of how it is that we are actually grafted into God's continuing purposes for Israel. And so a lie has been bought. We're disconnected from our roots. So that must mean, so the lie goes, we get the new covenant direct. We just somehow get it direct. The fact that in Scripture, in the Old Testament, any place a new covenant is promised is to the house of Judah, to the house of Israel. But there is this assumption somehow, oh no, we can get it direct. Now if you get any kit, you get a piece of, you're making some structure or something, but you didn't actually have the instructions. So you put it together as best you can. But it's not connected together. It's not wired together properly. So it sort of works. You say, well, I must have got it roughly right. But it's not right. It's not how it was made to work. It will never function as it was really meant to do. And that is this picture of the church that you and I find ourselves in, in this day that is so affected. Let me just give you one extra little picture. A picture of Luther. And at the Reformation... Luther is the man who rediscovers the gospel of grace. And so he gets hold of Romans 1.17. And there's this righteousness which is from faith to last by faith. And he gets hold of this. And this is really where the Reformation comes from. How is it that he could not read one verse before which says that the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile? Unless there was the most incredible veil that was over his eyes. And that is the situation that we are in today, as if gospel has come down from the Reformation to us. This gospel which is partial, this gospel which has missed the wholeness of the truth. There was such a warning that Paul gave in Romans 11 to the church about this. And he said two things. He said, never about the truth of Israel be either ignorant or arrogant. There will be great danger if you become ignorant or arrogant. Two verses, Romans 11:25. he says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may be conceited. And he goes on to say, do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. And we are in a situation where a major proportion of the church is actually ignorant of relationship with God, which comes through being grafted into Israel. Amen. Just ignorance. But I have to tell you an experience we've had since releasing this film is how much arrogance we've hit up against. It has been shocking. There is a small proportion who truly want to do battle, and I'm, I'm quite happy with that crowd. I don't mind a bit of a ding-dong. If, you, if you're on the winning side from the start, you have nothing to be afraid of. I'm, I'm up for a good rough and tough. Because I know we've got the truth on our side. What is shocking is a huge proportion who are just plain indifferent. Plain indifferent. Now amongst those who are ignorant, if you take this and if you share it with them, and they actually work this through, some of them get it just like that. Others, it takes a few goes to get it. I think one of the analogies I found amongst many people, it's rather like if you're sitting on a chair and there's actually some chewing gum on the chair, I hope this doesn't apply to any of you right now, you don't know it right now. So only when you try to stand up, you know you're sitting on the chewing gum. And so many people are sitting on a seat glued to replacement theology. It's only when they try and get up that they've got a problem. But we've seen many people released. But for the arrogant ones, what's it going to take to get them out 
of indifference. Is the only answer shaking? Do you think that those words in Haggai 2 which speak of a great shaking which is going to come in the end times, do you think this could possibly apply to the church in the near future? This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. If there's going to be glory in the house, it's only going to be because there will be a great shaking. Rather like with a brick wall that's got a crack at the foundation. It doesn't matter how fancy the brickwork further up. When the shaking comes, you discover where the crack was. And I would want to suggest to you that though God does not delight to shake his church, where there is arrogance about this, God's going to bring a shaking. God's going to bring a shaking. Because his desire is that there will be glory in the church and also reverence and awe. We also read Ephesians, uh, sorry, Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God with reverence and awe. And for those who are firmly founded, when the shaking comes, we'll discover how strong that foundation actually is. We will discover the strength. We'll discover that's why we can indeed bold, be bold. And when there is glory in the church, when there is reverence, when there is awe, it will lead to the roar. The awe will lead to the roar. And there are three rules that I believe that God wants to bring through his church at this time. The first rule we've already heard, which is the roar of triumph. This roar which comes from Hosea 11.10. It says, they will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, says the Lord. This is the first roar. We're beginning to see the signs of that roar coming. The roar of great triumph as his people return. But in Scripture, there are three roars of the lion. They come in just pages apart in the Old Testament. Just after Hosea comes Joel. And if you turn into Joel chapter 3, there's a roar which is about justice. Joel 3.14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened. The stars will no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion. And thunder Jerusalem, the sky and the earth will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. The third roar comes from... The light's coming. <laughs> third roar, the last roar, comes from Amos, just a page or two later. The roar of justice. Surely the sovereign of the Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The Lord has roared. Who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. Three roars of the Lord that he wants to come through his people at this time. The roar of triumph, of justice, and of warning. Let me finish with the trailer from the film, Let the Lion Roar. the trailer there. For almost 2,000 years, an evil deception has been sustained by key church leaders. This insidious conspiracy has stolen the church's identity. It has withheld the church's destiny. It has blinded millions. Until now. is annihilated, the church will be one. When this deception is rescinded, the church will finally operate in its complete power. All of this will take place once the ancient conspiracy is fully revealed.
discover the truth. Derek, thank you so much. We truly are living in a time of such incredible anti-Semitism. It's taking place all across the world and even here in America to an alarming degree. And most people don't even know why they hate the Jews. They just do. Derek, thank you for this. A couple of things real quick before you make your way to the tent outside for dining. Number one, be sure that you take your card that you're going to need. Put your name on the back because we're going to have a drawing here a little bit. And whoever draws this card gets a one-year magazine subscription. Whoever draws the card with two on it gets $50 to spend out here at the book table. And whoever draws the card with one on it gets an entire conference set of their choice. So be sure you put your names on there. And let's express our appreciation again. Listen, I've heard a lot of presentations about replacement theology. This was marvelous. God bless you. So, Father, we're grateful for our day. Thank you for our time to be together. Now, bless us as we go and share a meal together. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. We will see you back here at 6, what is it? 6.45. All right. See you then.